Welcome to the Belly Button Window channel and episode 36 of the Jimi Hendrix story, like you've never heard it before. In this episode, we deep dive into July of 1969, Jimmy's US television appearances, the Shokan Retreat, and the formation of Gypsies, Sons, and Rainbows. Please remember to check the channel's community tab and video information page, where you will find links to related videos, performances, and stunning photographs from the period. According to Hendrix author, Frank Moriarty, as the summer of 1969 began to heat up, Jimi Hendrix found himself to be a musician without a band. The original lineup of the experience had played their final show on June 29th at the Denver Pop Festival, the curtain coming down on Hendrix's groundbreaking trio amid clouds of tear gas deployed by a police force determined to regain control over a rebellious audience. Suddenly, the headlong momentum that had driven Hendrix to the peaks of stardom was now a spent force. Jimmy found himself back in New York, adrift, and wondering what was next, before appearing on the two most popular late-night television shows on American TV within days of each other. And since there was no longer a Jimi Hendrix experience, Jimmy's national television appearances, both broadcast from New York, found him backed by unusual musical aggregations. Tuesday, the 1st of July. Jimmy arrives in New York City and stays at the Navarro Hotel. Then the following day, Wednesday, the 2nd of July, he participates in a jam session with Bill Lorden on drums and Willie Weeks on bass at the legendary Café Ogogo. Just as a recap, the Café Ogogo was a Greenwich Village nightclub located in the basement of the new Andy Warhol Garrick Theatre in the late 1960s and located at 152 Bleecker Street in Manhattan. The club featured many well-known musical groups, popular singers and comedy acts from its opening in February 1964 and closing in October 1969. Bill Lorden remembers, Willie Weeks and I met Joey Davis Southern, who was a friend of Buddy Miles, and through him, Joey knew Jimi Hendrix. One day, Willie and I, on kind of a bet or a dare, said to Joey that we were tired of what we were doing, and can he get us a jam with Jimi Hendrix, because we were big fans. Joey didn't say much, but came back a week or so later, and pulled up in a limousine and said, we were going to New York. Willie, Joey and I flew to New York, and stayed at the Penn Garden Hotel across from Madison Square Garden. We proceeded to the Café Ogogo in Greenwich Village, where it was all set up through Joey and Jimmy for us to come down and jam. It was a jam audition. Jimmy was looking for members to be in his dream band, Gypsy Sons and Rainbows, that he told us about after dinner the first night. Jimmy wanted musicians on his level who could hear what he was doing and compliment it without him having to tell them what to play. We jammed three days in a row, with Willie on bass and myself on drums. The sessions were in the mid-afternoon and lasted until evening. The music we were jamming on were songs that Jimmy had for his next album, which was The Cry of Love. Jimmy played his guitar through Elliot Randall's Fender Amps. Elliot was with C-Train, who were playing at the club that weekend. After the sessions, we went across the street to a restaurant to eat with his entourage. I met Floyd Rose at the Café Ogogo, New York, who was inventing special effects pedals for Jimmy at the time and invented the first locking guitar system. There were lots of women coming by the table introducing themselves, who were all interested in meeting the star. On another night, Buddy Miles and Billy Cox were there, as well as a large group of people who always seemed to be around Jimmy. After the evening dinner, we drove in Jimmy's limousine and went back to his hotel to hang out and talk for a while, before returning to our hotel. One evening, we went down to the club called The Scene. We saw a relatively unknown band at the time. The band was Sha Na Na. At the end of most evenings, Jimmy would go back to one of his places, as he had more than one place to get away from everyone and find some peace and have some space. On the third night, we were at the dinner table, and Jimmy turned to me and said, I want you to play drums. The 2nd of July will also be remembered as the day Brian Jones died at his home in Sussex. Those in the know say that Brian Jones' death deeply affected Jimmy. Thursday, the 3rd of July. According to Frank Moriarty, Jimmy migrates out of New York City, to a large, rural, rented house in Boyceville, a property in upstate New York, complete with horses and stables, located four miles from the town of Woodstock. The area had popped up on rock radar screens, beginning in 1967, when it became a hub for Bob Dylan, his manager Albert Grossman, and members of the band. It later drew an expanding cast of musical characters, including Todd Rundgren and Paul Butterfield. All were attracted by a rootsy arts scene, and what appeared to be a permanent laid-back vibe in the small town of Woodstock itself. Manager Mike Jeffery, 
seeking to reinforce a hip in the no image, also had made the 100-mile trek north of Manhattan and established himself in the trendy Woodstock area in 1969, buying a home in Woodstock proper and encouraged his number one client to do the same, making it all the easier for Jeffrey to keep an eye on Hendrix's activities. He first encouraged Hendrix to visit and stay in a garage apartment on the property. He then suggested that Jimmy rent his own place in the area. While these suggestions may have been presented as being in Jimmy's best interest, there's little doubt that the best way Jeffrey could keep his eye on his chief income generator was by having him nearby. Eventually, Hendrix found the sprawling eight-bedroom Boyceville Manor house and pronounced it suitable, often referred to in the Hendrix world as the Shokan House after the neighboring town of Shokan, it wasn't long before the property was host to Juma Sultan and his girlfriend. While many in the area fancied themselves living a country lifestyle, Jimmy, with his taste in Corvettes, didn't quite fit the farmer mold. When he wasn't zooming up and down the New York State Thruway on his frequent visits to Manhattan, he did. Still, he made the scene and was photographed riding horses. Moriarty goes on to say, Jeffrey had reason for concern. The manager wanted Jimmy to form an experience-like unit and get back on the road, but Hendrix seemed more interested in expanding his musical horizons. Jimmy had already fallen in with Juma Sultan, a percussionist with an earthy Afro-jazz flair, who was also on the Woodstock scene, and known for his work co-founding the Aboriginal Music Society Arts Organization. In the end, and more by happenstance than by design, a rainbow coalition of musicians would coalesce around the guitarist at the Shokan House. Three black musicians, a white Englishman, and a Puerto Rican would join him in trying to put the post-experience pieces together again. Jimmy's new friend, Juma Sultan, was on board, and perhaps it was no surprise that Hendrix would invite his army pal, Billy Cox, to fulfill the bass role. And another percussionist, Jerry Vellas, had become acquainted with Jimmy through jams at the scene club, and now was incorporated into this new lineup. Weeks later, Mitch Mitchell was summoned to return from England to play drums, although he never really warmed to the additional musicians. While Harry Shapiro and Caesar Glebeek wrote, ostensibly the Shokan House was to be a place where Jimmy could put his rock star career on hold for a while. The house was set in huge grounds with riding facilities, a swimming pool, gardens and all the accoutrements of celebrity seclusion, and featured eight bedrooms, each with its own sitting room set off with a wood-burning stove. Rare antiques furnished much of the house, including Jimmy's room, which had a French antique makeup table, but he was to create his own environment with beautifully decorated Moroccan rugs brought from his various New York apartments at $3,000 a month rent. It was intended to bring some peace and quiet, and thus worth every penny. All Jimmy needed now was his musicians to fill the place. Previously, while he was finishing his commitments with the experience, Jimmy asked Billy Cox to stay in New York, setting him up temporarily with the Buddy Miles Express so he wouldn't starve. Once the Denver Pop Festival was out of the way, Jimmy began to move into gear. Jimmy asked Billy if he ever knew what happened to Larry Lee, his old guitar buddy from Nashville days, the man who gave Jimmy his coat for the freezing trip to New York in 1963. Can you find him? said Jimmy. Sure, said Billy. I know his mother. Oh. While Hendrix's author, John McDermott, pointed out that Chaos ruled at the musical retreat in Shokan, as Hendrix struggled to define his new musical direction. Mitch was still in England, and though the rumour of an appearance by Buddy Miles refused to dissipate, Hendrix, Larry Lee and Cox, as well as percussionist Jerry Velez and Juma Sultan, were involved in lengthy jam sessions, which at times included keyboards into his new music. Hendrix also recruited former group therapy keyboardist Jerry Guida to the Shokan house for a short stint. Though Jimmy may have sought a quiet retreat among Woodstock's fabled wilds, he managed to stand out as much as he had in Harlem. Jimmy used to drive through town in his red Corvette, recalls Leslie Aday, an employee of Albert Grossman, who became friendly with Hendrix during his extended period upstate. He'd have the top down and be dressed up in all his glory. Nobody in Woodstock had a red Corvette. These people were into growing organic vegetables and making their own clothes. While author John Platt pointed out that, by this time Mitch had played with Billy Cox, at least in the studio, a good, solid and reliable bass player and a nice man. Noel was funny, always a constant source of musicians' gags, and Jimmy and Mitch certainly loved him for that, and he was really good on stage, constantly strutting around. The bottom line, though, was that he was a frustrated guitar player 
and Mitch thinks that got a bit annoying for Hendrix. And when Jimmy played with other bass players like Jack Cassidy, who really loved playing bass, he noticed the difference. Monday, the 7th of July. Appearing on The Dick Cavett Show, Jimmy performed Hear My Trainer Coming with the assistance of members of the house band, the Bob Rosengarden Orchestra. Rosengarden himself manned the drums. During this interview, Hendrix modestly downplays his abilities and displays his sense of humor. Perhaps more importantly, he reveals some of his aesthetic ideals and the purpose of his music as he viewed it then when he spoke of his concept of electric church, saying that music is getting to be more spiritual than anything now. Pretty soon I believe that they are going to have to rely on music to get some kind of peace of mind or satisfaction, direction, actually more so than politics, because politics is really on an ego scene. Politics is the art of words, which means nothing. So therefore you have to rely on one more of an earthier substance like music, or the arts, theater, acting, painting, whatever. The electric church is a belief that I have. We do use electric guitars, everything is electrified nowadays. So therefore the belief comes through electricity to people. That's why we play so loud, because it doesn't actually hit through the eardrums like most groups do nowadays. They say, well, we're going to play loud too because they're playing loud. And they've got this real shrill sound that's really hard. We plan for our sound to go inside the soul of the person and see if they can awaken some sort of thing in their minds because there are so many sleeping people. Thursday, the 10th of July, Jimi Hendrix was booked to appear on The Johnny Carson Show, except that night the black comedian Flip Wilson was the guest host. Harry Shapiro and Cesar Glebeek claim that, according to John Delgado, curator of the Carson Productions, this was no coincidence. Carson ducked out of interviewing Jimmy because of all the publicity being given to the Black Panthers at the time. Delgado opines that Carson's concern for his image put Flip Wilson in the host chair that night. Wilson asked Jimmy if he wanted to make any comments relating to the widely reported belief that his performances were a spiritual experience. Jimmy said that, because music was his whole life, its performance became his religion and likened the experience of his music to the gospel church. We're trying to get the same thing through modern-day music. Then Wilson replied by saying, Well, Jim, it's my pleasure to extend an invitation to you to whip a light sermon on us. Hendrix then introduced Billy Cox, our new bass player, and then had two attempts at Love a Man when Jimmy's amp blew. According to Charles R. Cross, Rolling Stone called the Johnny Carson appearance a disaster, citing Jimmy's excessive giggling and gum chewing, which made it hard to understand what he said. Jimmy obsessively chewed blackjack licorice gum, particularly when he was nervous. The magazine was even harder on Wilson, who they wrote, tried to hip-talk himself onto Hendrix's level while patting a huge watermelon on his desk. After Jimmy's brief chat with Wilson, he moved to the stage for his first public performance with the rhythm section of Cox and Mitchell. They played Lover Man, which Jimmy dedicated to Brian Jones. Cox and Mitchell sounded fine, but unfortunately Jimmy's amplifier blew up, which derailed the live broadcast. Friday the 11th of July a proposed concert at the Apollo Theatre in Harlem was cancelled. Originally, it was planned that the proceeds would be donated to Biafra Calls, a charitable organization. Then, Saturday the 12th of July, Jimmy visits Manny's Musical Instruments store in New York for some equipment purchases. Monday the 21st of July, the proposed New York Shea Stadium concert is cancelled. Hendrix signs a letter for a salary authorization of $500 from Michael Hecht for the musicians who will later play at Woodstock, Jerry Velez, Larry Lee and Billy Cox. He also receives $2,100 cash advance from Bob Levine, which will be his pocket money for his Moroccan vacation. Shortly thereafter, Jimmy departs New York for Paris on his way to Morocco, with Deering Howe where he will spend an 11-day vacation. According to Hendrix author, Charles R. Cross, Jimmy first met Deering Howe in 1968, when Howe's yacht had been rented for the band to take a one-day cruise, and Deering became one of Jimmy's closest confidants after that. Howe's family owned several Manhattan hotels, and he was a music fan, but not directly involved in the music business. I think part of the attraction was that I came from money and there was nothing I wanted from him, Deering recalled. We had almost nothing in common, except for a love of music. In addition to Deering, Jimmy met and befriended two women who ran a boutique where he shopped. Colette Mimram and Stella Douglas were both more cultured than Jimmy, and he found that appealing, along with their fashion sense. He was simply a charming gentleman, Colette recalled. I think he gravitated towards us because we were outside of his world. In his world, 
Everybody was after him for something. No one had a job other than Jimmy, and he thought they all wanted a handout. With Colette, Stella, and Deering, Jimmy developed his first adult friendships that were outside the music industry. We'd expose him to a certain refinement that he had never experienced before, Colette noted. We were a group of people who would gather and eat together and talk. The frequent dinners were relaxed and served as breaks from the stress of Jimmy's career. One rule was that business was never to be discussed. With his friends, Jimmy talked about art, philosophy, religion, and politics. He found the group fascinating, if only because he felt like a cultural apprentice around them, the opposite of his experience as a musician, where he was the trendsetter. Jimmy had originally gone to New York to see off Deering Howe, who was traveling to Africa to meet up with Colette Mimram and Stella Douglas. Deering urged Jimmy to join them, arguing that there was no reason to earn money if one couldn't spend it. In a rare flouting of his tendency to follow orders from management, Jimmy agreed. He phoned Michael Jeffrey, who was furious, but couldn't stop Jimmy, and he phoned the police in Toronto, who had to approve any travel outside the United States. With the drug charges still hanging over him, Jimmy desperately needed a break, and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police were kind enough to approve his trip. While according to Harry Shapiro and Caesar Glibeek, back at the Shoken House, things were somewhat confused. When Larry Lee first got there, he was alone with Billy Cox, Juma Sultan and Jerry Velez. He recalled, We rehearsed as best we could, we didn't have a band. We had some cats from the Paul Butterfield band who were living in Woodstock at the time, and we were waiting on Mitch, we were waiting on Buddy. Then one day, Jimmy said he was going into town, and some way we didn't see him no more. So we called the office in New York, and they told us Jimmy was in France or somewhere. So we spent a lot of time up there doing nothing. Arriving in Morocco, Jimmy surprises Colette and Stella, who came to meet Deering Howe off the plane. Thrilled at his arrival, Jimmy, Deering, and the girls rented an old Chrysler with a driver, traveling across the country, staying in Marrakesh, Casablanca, and Mohammedia, until they came to Essouria and met up with the living theater. Harry Shapiro and Caesar Glebeek noted that, while in Morocco Jimmy gained another following, was it because he allowed himself to be ripped off for tourist merchandise, saying that the sellers needed the money more than he did? Or was it that the local kids followed him everywhere, not only because of his, to them, strange way of dressing, but also because he bore a striking resemblance to a North African superstar called Vigon? However, opinions differ about whether Jimmy actually enjoyed his Moroccan sojourn. Colette, who was there, says that Jimmy had a wonderful time, telling how he would sit poolside in one of the hotels, gently playing Deering Howe's acoustic guitar. It was probably the only vacation he really ever had. It was very relaxed and very peaceful and very wonderful. There was no hassle, it was really a lot of fun, Colette recalled. But Juma Sultan maintains that there were some mysterious circumstances behind the whole situation. I think Jimmy going wasn't totally by choice. Jimmy himself told friends later that he did not enjoy himself very much. For a start, it was too hot for him, and he refused to take off his shirt because he didn't want to get burned. Then there were these men following them about everywhere. Who were they? And why were they still there when Jimmy got home? Was Mike Jeffrey spying on him? A better guess would be that it had something to do with Jimmy's drug bust. The thrust of the prosecution case would be that far from a victim of a fan's thoughtless gift. Jimmy was a hardened drug user. It is possible that arrangements were made to have Jimmy followed out of the country to see what he got up to, especially as he was going to Morocco, where the streets were lined with hash. In dismissing the trip, Jimmy may also have been reflecting with sadness on a country much loved by his friend Brian Jones, who had very recently been found floating in his own swimming pool, rendered insensible by the cocktail of drugs in his system. Surprisingly, Jimmy insisted on adding a second guitarist to the mix. The name Larry Lee would not bring any recognition from rock fans. Instead, Jimmy had once again turned to a Nashville friend with shared army roots. After receiving his discharge, Hendrix had briefly played in the Tennessee area with band lineups that included Lee and Billy Cox. In May 1969, he'd written Lee on stationery from New York's Hotel Navarro. I will get in touch with you within the next two weeks. Lee had assumed he'd never see Jimmy again, especially now that stardom had arrived. But in mid-July, Lee found himself on the way north for a reunion. For Lee and Cox, the contrast between life in Nashville and Woodstock, Manhattan, must have been mind-bending. Cox had at least had some time to adjust to Hendrix's new rock star life since they'd first reunited in April.
but Lee was pulled by Jimmy directly into this chaotic orbit soon after returning from Vietnam, where he'd been shot in the head and nearly killed. For the most part, Hendricks was enjoying his northern retreat. The house Jeffrey had rented for him came with horses and a stable. Apart from Juma Sultan, a local, no one knew how to ride, yet everybody gave it a go. There were also cookouts, informal interplay between the musicians, and a general sense of fun. Drugs were certainly prevalent at Hendrix's Shokan retreat, in spite of his impending trial for possession, as well as being openly obtainable throughout the Woodstock community. Hendrix had not curbed his drug intake following the bust, and still viewed drugs, predominantly marijuana, as a recreational exercise. With the addition of the percussionists, Velez and Sultan, author John McDermott noted that Hendrix couldn't help plowing through their delicate polyrhythmic patterns. He had not yet integrated softer elements into his live music, volume and feedback remaining the essential ingredients of his style. Even his rhythm playing, while not as bombastic as his solo work, was still delivered with great force. It would be this simple fact, plus a lack of adequate rehearsal time, that would doom Gypsy's Sons and Rainbows the moniker he invented for his new band. A strange dichotomy evolved from Gypsy Sons and Rainbow's lengthy jam sessions. Hendrix, Cox and Lee shared a love for the hybrid form of blues, R&B and rock and roll, on which they had not only been reared but had based their careers. With Mitchell back behind the drums, Lee's rhythm guitar provided a tasteful accompaniment to Red House and Hear My Train, bolstering Hendrix's blues masterworks. What hampered Gypsy Sons and Rainbow's development was the dearth of new material composed with the big band in mind. Congas simply had no place in Foxy Lady or Purple Haze, and even if such material could be reworked to include this and other subtle instruments, that goal would only signify a regression for Hendrix. That concludes this installment of the series. Stay tuned for the next episode, where we will begin the deep dive into August of 1969, including Jimmy's Moroccan Holiday and the iconic Woodstock Music and Art Fair. Don't forget to subscribe for future content updates. And by the way, if you have any photos, stories, or anecdotes to contribute, we would love to hear from you. Until next time.